Um, welcome, uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are joining us from. Um, this is a session on water sector capacity building and gender sensitivity hosted by the UNESCO International Center for Water Security and Sustainable Development, UNESCO IWSSM for short, and UNESCO Jakarta. Uh, my name is Christine Kim and I am a program specialist here at IWSSM. Uh, before we officially begin our session, I would like to let you know that this session is being recorded. Um, also, I would like to request that you direct any questions you may have to the passable chat box where it will be monitored. Um, but also please note that we will be saving all questions for the end of the session. Uh, now, since we have a very jam-packed schedule ahead of us, I will go right ahead and pass the floor to our moderator, Dr. Hans Dahlstrup, Senior Program Specialist at UNESCO Jakarta office. Hans, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Christine. It's, uh, it's really a genuine pleasure for me to be part of this session, to be working with uh, all of you, the team at the IWSSM, and all of our speakers and panelists uh, today. Um, as Christine said, my name is Hans Tostrup. I work with UNESCO's office in Jakarta, where I uh, support the regional programs for water and environmental science. We have what we're confident will be an excellent session prepared for you uh, today. We are working under the title Gender and SDG 6A towards gender sensitive water sector capacity building. We're going to look closer at the gender dimensions of SDG 6A on international cooperation and capacity building. And to do that, we have a uh, panel of speakers that include both uh, water education practitioners as well as gender specialists who will help identify some concrete uh, methods for addressing the gender dimensions of water education and training. So we're going to look specifically at water, capacity building, and gender. Uh, the speakers are going to introduce us to some uh, practices, best practices, perhaps less fortunate practices from, from the field. And we're going to have, if Time allows, as Christine mentioned, we, we may, as the session is not long, we may have a challenge in terms of time. We'll try and get as much time for discussion in uh, so that you can uh, air your own uh, views and the feedback uh, to us uh, at the end of the session. Now, before we get into the, to the presentations themselves, I just want to give you a very brief introduction to each speaker. Uh, each of our speakers will, will talk for 10 minutes, uh, ideally uh, not more than that. Um, you've already met Christine, you've met uh, uh, myself. Uh, before we get to our uh, panelists, speakers, we will have uh, a few opening remarks from uh, Dr. Bong Wu Shin, who's the director of uh, our convening organization today, UNESCO IWSSM Center. After the opening remarks, we'll hear from Professor Mei Lim from the Iowa Women's University. She'll talk about gender mainstreaming in the water sector development cooperation capacity building programs. We're then going to hear from uh, Dr. Uh, Guillaume Baggio. He's a research associate with the United Nations University Institute for Water, Environment and Health. And he'll talk specifically on the SDG 6 support system to bridge the evidence gap, strengthen decision-making. We then have uh, Dr. Laurenti of uh, the Gender and Communications Officer with UNESCO's World Water Assessment Program uh, he's going to talk to us about uh, accelerating gender equality in the water domain with a focus on uh, data and funding. And then rounding off the, the speakers will be uh, Dr. Kwan uh, Kao out Suk, the Lao Country Director of East Meets West. Uh, he's going to talk uh, to us uh, about increased systemic participation of women as change agents in the wash sector. And that rounds off our speakers for this morning. Now, the very alert participant to this uh, discussion may have noticed that in spite of the best efforts of the organizers, the speakers panel is not entirely gender balanced. It's something we're well aware of uh, in, in, in the session today. And uh, it's something that in a way speaks to the challenges that we aim to address through the session. So it may be something we can return to in, in the discussion uh, later on. And now to really get us started, uh, we would like to invite uh, Director uh, Shin from IWSSM to deliver us his opening remarks and get us underway. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, welcome to this session hosted by UNESCO IWSSM and UNESCO Jakarta. 
on gender sensitivity water sector capacity building. As you may all know, gender equality is one of UNESCO's two global priorities and the water sector is no exception to this rule. For this reason, our center as part of UNESCO's water family is continuously striving to increase the gender sensitivity of all our programs and projects. Today's session begins with what in our opinion should be the starting point for addressing gender equality in water. In order to create capacity building programs and knowledge dissemination method that do not reflect or perpetuate existing forms of inequality, we must find new ways of approaching learning and teaching. Therefore, today's session will be an opportunity for all of us to re-examine our understanding of water sector capacity building. I sincerely hope that all of you will, as educators, as students, as leaders, and as policymakers, be able to take away at least one key message from today's session for increasing gender sensitivity in your daily work. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shin, for this uh, uh, introduction and a really uh, motivational uh, message for, for all of us uh, as we begin session. With that, I am happy to introduce our first speaker of the day, and that would be Professor Eun Mi Lim. I am very happy to turn the floor over to uh, Professor Lim for her presentation. Okay, so can I start? Okay. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Emil Lim at the Iwa Women's University. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about the gender mainstreaming in, as my title says, in the water sector development cooperation with a focus on the uh, capacity building programs. Uh, as you know, the SDG is next. Uh, actually, this is not the first slide. Yes, then, then for next slide, please. So you all know that because six two uh, says special attention to the needs of women and girls and those in vulnerable situation. And then just like today's this section's uh, uh, agenda, six uh, a says expand international cooperation and capacity building support to developing countries in water and sanitation related activity. So you're uh, talking about international cooperation. So my study is actually uh, is talking about the international cooperation assistance within the context of international cooperation assistance. Next slide. So uh, with that, uh, the two goals, I came up with the three questions. The is international development cooperation in water and sanitation sector really targeting the needs of women and girls? And then how do we uh, enhance or uh, build gender equality capacity in water and sanitation related OD activities and programs? And then, of course, and how do we mainstream gender equality in the water sanitation sector, especially in terms of capacity building programs? Next slide. So this uh, pie chart shows the uh, the the uh, dark OECD doc uh, aid in support of gender equality. I collected the, the, all the information data from the OECD creator reporting system. Uh, from 19, uh, 2016 and 2019. Uh, gentlemen, you may be aware of the, with the gender equality marker. Uh, gender equality marker is the uh, OECD DARK's uh, statistical tool to track the each ODA activities, whether they, uh, each activities are targeting gender uh, equality objectives. So principal objective means that this particular project and programs are targeting uh, the, the, for the gender equality objective. In other words, if the project has an explicit objective, okay, uh, and goals, and then the significant objective is called usually gender marker one, first one is gender marker two, gender marker one's uh, significant objective is they, they track, and then this uh, particular 
aid activities. In their activities, gender equalities, yes, is an important, however, it's not really primary, but it's a secondary objective. So uh, in the field of development cooperation, we say principal objective plus significant objective are regarded as a gender equality target aid activities. So as you can see in the pie chart, uh, 61% of all aid uh, uh, OECD uh, ODA, uh, uh, DAC ODA, uh, in the sector of water and sanitation was not targeting gender at all. Okay, so next slide. So uh, I looked at this, uh, the uh, sector uh, of, okay, in terms of sub-sector, sub-areas, and in terms of why uh, that uh, dark code is a purpose. So when you look at that, so you can see the right side, all the, uh, the bar chart. Mostly the aid has been distributed to the area, so-called largest system infrastructure uh, oriented project and programs. And there is some uh, uh, purple colors is, yes, is a significant objective, not directly targeting gender equality, but somehow they are related. And okay, so next slide. So I was wondering who's giving the most in the water sector. And obviously it's a, a, a Japan. Predominantly there's four, three uh, major countries are the major players or donors in the field, in the sector of water. So J Japan is number one, two, Germany, France, United States, UK. But I was very surprised when I was doing this study, I was quite surprised that Korea actually came up number seven. So it's, it's uh, out of uh, 28, nine uh, members, Korea ranked number seven. So Korea is a very important, I argue, is, is important uh, donors and actors. Next slide, please. So, but this time I, I chose up to seven, which is Korea's number seven. So I looked at again, in terms of uh, donor countries, which uh, uh, area, sub areas they give most. Again, as you can see in the right side, it's all mostly concentrated in all these top countries are concentrated in the field area, subsector area, large system focused infrastructure, economy infrastructure focused, uh, uh, focused areas. Next slide. So I'm very nervous about the time limit. Okay, so here. So uh, now we know that, we all know that yeah, the gender equality has been emphasized and we all, there are so many discussions, workshops and, you know, and then studies been done to increase the gender equalities in the area of water sector, but mostly focus on wash areas, basic drinking, and basic sanitations. Yes, they we have some you know evidence that that the aid has been gone to that area, but mostly, as you just saw, most um, predominant amount of aid goes to the the other side. So less my I would like to say the less attention has been paid to the fact that most water project program, especially related with large system, have not integrated gender equality at all, or if have done very little. So we need to see the gender equality capacity building in a very, very different, or maybe we need, it's time for us to think about the gender equality capacity building in those sectors. Particularly Korea later will show, next slide. So this is the, the, the two pictures that I, 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 I copied and collected from the, uh, the, the report from the center, the, the UNESCO or Water Security Center. So one is, there, there, this is their capacity building programs. One is, you can see the male, can see, the other one is, is a gender, so-called gender workshop, all women. Very much even the capacity building program, I see at least based on these pictures, very gendered because this left side, the men, is very often this water is regarded as very technical, very economic commercial areas, especially in the large system area. But when you talk about the gender and water, we all talk about the wash areas. And it's much about the women's issues. Next slide. So why? I argue that this is kind of concept of water, meaning of water is very gendered also. The women often, okay, so for women's side, woman is regarded as end user, man was manager, and a woman was a consumer in the house activity, man is a producer in market activities. Women for, and water for women is substance purpose. Men for, you know, men, case men, water is a technology and science. 
So I argue that the water is very much feminized and also very masculinized, masculinized. Okay, so two ways. And so we are talking about this is the, uh, the world of water sector, I argue, from the gender perspective. And so lack of gender equality objectives in the water project program, particularly in the large system oriented ODA activities. So it's time for us to think about the restructure or I think at least we think about what's going on. So we need to have a, the, uh, or need to have adequate strategies to address these issues. Next slide. So again, so uh, gender mass being very much emphasized and the many donors and, and international organizations and all even the recipient countries, partner countries, they all try. So, but one of the most uh, popular way so-called, quote unquote, is at women. So gender quotas, 20%, 30%. And I was quite happily surprised that the, uh, this water security center has high uh, portion of female participants. I think that's wonderful. That's what we have been you know, uh, arguing for. And then, but now you can see there's some women but still predominantly male oriented. But here is, but I'm so glad that we have all male because it's, these males are very interesting. You are the, we need more male like you, men like you, because it's a, you know, gender advocates, gender experts, okay? But thing is, but there are questions, these men here, how we transform the trans or transform these men into gender experts like you, that through the capacity building, that's my issues. Next slide. So Korean case, as you can, the right, see that one big, you know, one part, it's all water supply, large system. Korea's money is all goes to here. And then you can see that the, uh, the, the yellow and now in the orange is for gender equality purpose. You, you don't see any very tiny little, okay? Parts, next slide. Given that situation, education training program is you can see that we can see those pictures of men participants and female participants. They are more likely still very gendered. And so I was very happy to find out that the, uh, the, the WSSM, you know, the center, water center has commitment. To, they have committed very strongly to develop the gender responsive, gender sensitive education program. However, unfortunately, when I look through their data, the, the, all their many uh, very interesting and wonderful the training program, they have they had none, zip, nada gender related programs, except one time that which has the picture we saw that gender and water workshop, all women. Okay, so next slide. So integrating a gender perspective into capacity building training, especially for very much masculinized water sector has been called for. That's what I want to say. Next one. So, um, um, this is kind of, you know, so we need to, to have a gender response capacity building. My argument is, yes, we need to continuously increase the female participants, but that's not enough. It's an adding number, add and stir uh, approach is not going to work. Sometimes women themselves do not know much about the gender nature of water. And so we need to train them as well, but we need to have more uh, very well developed training program for male too, male participants. That's what we, at least in Korea, lacking. I hope that the, the center is going to lead that directions in Korea. So next slide, please. Uh, so because of time limit, I, uh, I thought I would not talk about in detail about the, what kind of program, uh, uh, curriculum and so forth will be, you know, must be in. But one thing I really suggested to the center was that in uh, heading one general introductory gender and development course, it's not gonna work. And so we need to have a very uh, integrated uh, curriculum development. That means all in their course curriculum program case, uh, the, the all gender responsive uh, aspect has been, must be integrated. So that's what the project cycle management, even we need to uh, have a program such as all these male and female participants understand the, in terms of project cycle management in each process, in stage, how gender 
uh, analysis must be done, how gender perspective, how the gender indicators must be included and used and whole, whole set kind of uh, programs. So uh, I would like to end, because I don't know, I have not timed my, uh, uh, my presentation, because again, it's just, my uh, brain doesn't work because my, my mind is all focused on, on a time. Now I, I probably missed some of the important parts, but uh, yes. So I'll uh, thank you. For, I'm not going to go into details here. Okay. So for example, plan a stage how gender must be in, in incorporated stage, and when they implement, what things must be done from a gender perspective and monitoring and evaluation. There are a bunch of studies. There are a bunch of the papers, and there's guidelines and tools being developed internationally and donor wise. However, we really I don't in my in my uh, memories and my thought I don't see. Uh, there are any uh, studies and then the way and toolkits that very clearly in a very success, very effective, very practical way they incorporate those gender aspects into their project and programs. I think we need to develop that, that, that part. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Lim. I think you were fine in terms of time. No, no problem at all. And some very important uh, perspectives, I think, from, from, from your side to this. A notion really that a kind of a transformation is is uh, required, so that we are uh, that everyone really is a gender expert in a sense by by as a base a foundational uh, skill and capacity. I think it's a it's a very important point to to take away from the presentation. So thank you so much for that. Uh, please, have to uh, those of you attending the session, of course, you have a possibility to uh, enter questions, or comments to the presenters. Please uh, feel free to do so, and we hope to be able to pick them up at the end of the session in the discussion or even after the session by, by correspondence. So, so we will pay attention to those, uh, those questions uh, that you may have. I'm happy now to uh, go on to our next uh, center uh, with uh, uh, Guillaume Baggio from the United Nations uh, University. Um, I will turn the floor over directly to Guillaume for his uh, talk as we continue our panel session today. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Hans. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Guillaume. I'm a research associate from the United Nations University Institute for Water, Environment and Health. And today I'm speaking from Toronto, Canada. And it's pretty much early in the morning for me, but I guess my audience is from everywhere. Uh, so today we will be analyzing the um, gender aspects of the SDG6 policy support system the SDG PSS was developed uh, as a tool to bridge the evidence gap uh, in decision-making for SDG 6. Next. Thank you. So one of the key aspects when we look at the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development is that we have several development outcomes. Uh, most of you probably know SDG 6. Uh, SDG 6 has several targets and indicators spanning from access to water, sanitation, but also water scarcity, uh, water management, um, um, uh, uh, freshwater ecosystems. So it goes beyond access to water and sanitation. But also there's another aspect of SDG 6 is the uh, larger presence of the enabling environments for sustainable development. So when we are talking about enabling environments, we are talking about the governance, institutional and financial systems uh, that exist in a country to support those development aspirations. So when a country aims to achieve something, the question that we are asking is, what are the enabling environments in place that could enable, facilitate uh, or hinder those development outcomes? Uh, so we can think as an example of enabling environment of uh, the policy and implementation plans developed by the country or adequate or inadequate financial uh, resources or uh, human resources that are adequate or inadequate for those development uh, aspirations. Next, please. Uh, and then when we are doing an assessment of the enabling environment of SDG 6, what we realize is that they are lacking behind. For most countries, the enabling environments available are not strong enough, are not developed enough. 
Uh, and this is uh, especially concerning for underdeveloped countries that uh, don't have the policy structures put in place or don't have the financial resources, uh, the adequate uh, financial resources to um, achieve th those development outcomes or don't have capacity uh, in place for those uh, aspirations. Uh, next, please. And there's another problem, and this is very concerning. Uh, so not only the enabling environments are not strong enough, uh, when we are looking at the evidence or the data for those enabling environments, it's simply missing uh, or overlapping or fragmented across many sectors, many ministries, many agencies. Uh, and uh, it, it, is, it is very difficult for countries to plan for stronger uh, enabling environments if they don't have that evidence. Uh, what we realized early on in the implementation of SDG 6 is that we needed to understand those gaps uh, and address the weaknesses and uh, strengths that uh, each country had. Next one, please. So um, when we look at SDG 6, we have uh, several needs, but then uh, now I'm talking only about the enabling environment of SDG 6. Uh, what we see is that those data gaps, those evidence gaps will remain for many years. Countries will not be able to easily address them right now in a few years. So there's a need to continue working with the data that we have, with the evidence that we have on the enabling environments while we are also tackling this gap uh, and producing that missing evidence. And we also need a place, a framework where uh, experts from the water sector can work together. Because when we are looking at this evidence, uh, as I said, it's, uh, it's often very fragmented and overlapping because it's coming from different sectors. Uh, when we, we are looking particularly at gender, most of this data don't come necessarily from the water sector or from the water agency or from the water ministry. It comes from other organizations that are working on gender aspects. So um, we needed a, a, a framework that helps countries getting this data, this evidence from multiple sectors. Next one, please. So facing this challenge, um, the UNU Inwe, in partnership with the UNOSD based in the Republic of Korea, the Minister of Environment of Republic of Korea and Keiko, along with national partners from Tunisia, Ghana, Pakistan, and Costa Rica, uh, reflected on the challenges of strengthening the enabling environments of these countries uh, while uh, working with um, the missing evidence on the enabling environments. And the key output of this project was the SDG 6 policy support system. Next one, please. Uh, Basically, this uh, support system can be understood as a tool that is organized around several policy critical components. Uh, I think you can see in the picture that we have capacity, finance, policy, and institutional assessment. We have status, integrity assessment, disaster risk reduction, and resilience. And we also have the component called gender mainstreaming. This uh, six, the seven uh, policy critical components were understood as uh, the way that countries could translate the enabling environments of SDG 6 into policy critical components. But then I'm talking only now about the gender mainstreaming component because I think that's the key, the key topic, uh, the key issue where we are uh, talking in this, um, in this um, conference today. Next one, please. So uh, when we built the gender component, there were three main dimensions that we needed to understand on SDG 6. The first one was gender analysis. So we needed to know if countries were undertaking a gender analysis for each SDG 6 uh, target and indicator. Uh, so uh, basically the question was, uh, were countries um, producing enough resources on gender mainstreaming for, uh, for each SDG 6 policy indicator. 
The second dimension that we looked was uh, the participation of women in decision-making process. So uh, whether or not women were being included systematically uh, in the decision-making processes. And the third dimension that we looked was the training and resources uh, put in place uh, whenever we are talking about um, the, the uh, benefits of incorporating the woman needs, knowledge and participation. So whether the uh, ministries and agencies responsible for each SDG 6 target and indicator within the country had those resources put in place. Next one, please. And the output of the SDG 6 policy support system uh, that is undertaken at the country level is this, um, this uh, evidence framework uh, that I'm showing now on the screen where you can see um, that there is a column called indicator and this is the SDG 6 indicator. And what you have here is the gender assessment according to those three dimensions for each SDG 6 uh, target and indicator. Uh, you can see uh, when the assessment is adequate, or in progress or inadequate. But the most important thing was the no evidence assessment. Because uh, as I said in the beginning of the presentation, one of the biggest problems when we were working with countries is to realize that there was no evidence for many gender aspects of SDG 6. But then when we asked the question, okay, where these gaps are for, for each SDG 6 target, for each indicator, they couldn't pinpoint that. They couldn't highlight exactly where the gaps were. So one of the key goals of this project was to highlight exactly where the gaps are and where countries uh, are progressing, where countries a need to, to, to strengthen their enabling environments on gender aspects of SDG 6, and where there are simply no evidence available at that moment. Um, and this is the key output of the SDG 6 policy support system. I think uh, I need to highlight that what you see on the screen now is at the country level. So for each country, there's a different assessment uh, this uh, picture was taken from uh, a work we did with uh, Tunisia, Pakistan, Ghana, and the Republic of Korea. The project now, the, uh, I'm sorry, the SDG 6 policy support system is now being used in other countries as well. Uh, next one, please. So uh, to summarize the contributions of this project, I think that we have to take a step back right in the beginning when we were thinking how to integrate a gender dimension on SDG 6, um, what we could find back in 2016 in the early stages of the SDG 6 implementation is uh, a lot of discussions on gender and access to water and sanitation. But I think the key idea here that we have to, to think a little bit is how the gender mainstreaming needs to reach all the SDG 6 targets and indicators. And we are talking about the water efficiency, water scarcity, water management, freshwater ecosystems. So the potential of this reflection is just how we integrate those uh, gender dimensions into the uh, SDG 6 as a whole. So to all SDG 6 targets and indicators beyond access to water and sanitation. Thank you so much. This is my contribution to the discussion today. Thank you very much for that uh, discussion, Guillaume. I think uh, uh, it's it's excellent to see this uh, this uh, policy support system coming into place. But I also take note, of course, that there is a significant potential to to expand the application and uh, and to and to address the gender uh, dimensions across a much broader uh, range of targets and indicators. So clearly, there's there's more work to be done, but but a very very important experience to to have uh, to start with. So again. Please feel free to, to post your questions to Guillaume and to, uh, to, to extend the discussion on this, uh, this important issue. Um, I'm very happy now to, to pass uh, the floor along to uh, our uh, colleague, uh, Lanty, from the World Water Assessment uh, Program, uh, who will uh, deliver our next uh, entry into the panel discussion. So uh, the floor is yours, uh, uh, Lon. Please uh, go ahead. 
Thank you so much, Hans. Um, and to everyone connected, your participants, uh, it's really my pleasure um, as General Communication Officer of the World Water Assessment Program to be here with you today and um, to present you some key findings of the work that we as the UNESCO World Water Assessment Program have been doing uh, with respect to promoting gender equality in the water domain and of course, how we can accelerate it. So the special focus of my presentation today will be on the aspect of data and uh, funding as being enabler to capacity building. Next slide, please. So the year 2020, um, it marked the year in which the global community celebrated the 25th anniversary of the adoption of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action. And it also marked a five-year milestone towards the end of the Agenda 2030. Uh, however, uh, evidence-based information on the progress made towards gender equality in the water domain seemed somehow fragmented, inadequate, or yeah, in many uh, cases, even unavailable. So in response to this, the UNESCO WAP convened a water and gender working group, which is formed by uh, 49 experts in the field of water and gender from different backgrounds. And together with this group, uh, we undertook an analysis on the progress made toward gender equality in the water domain over the last two and a half decades. Uh, next, please. So this thorough analysis um, culminated in a publication titled, Taking Stock of Progress Towards Gender Equality in the Water Domain. And it basically shows us, the, the key takeaway message is that uh, progress towards the achievement of the goals set in international declarations and agenda is absolutely not on track. And in particular, I want to point out a few key findings. Uh, the first is that gender considerations included in policies, they do not necessarily translate into advances in, in practice, uh, as we see that the gap between policy and practice is actually widening. And um, then second, there is a persistent low participation of women as professionals in the, in the water resources domain, and even more pronounced so in terms of leadership roles. Um, this while, meanwhile, actually women are overrepresented in the informal uh, water sector and in low or unpaid jobs. Um, third, um, persistent social norms and stereotypes they mean that women and girls actually face additional barriers to education and they lack opportunities to uh, informal water education and training, which then in turn leads to a skill gap. Um, fourth, there is, um, well, the problem of funding, as adequate funding uh, much needed uh, to implement capacity development, data collection and relevant programs or projects uh, is actually falling short. Then lastly, there is an acute lack of reliable and up-to-date uh, water data uh, disaggregated by sex or other factors. Um, so let's take a look at um, the enabling factors of data and funding. Next, please. So to ensure a better informed water policy and decision making that is actually leaving no one behind and to close this skill gap. First of all, we should be able to measure and evaluate who has access to water and who reaps the benefits, right? So this means knowing who accesses water, how, how much, uh, when and for which purposes exactly. And so for this, and to reveal women's uh, role in the water domain, as well as to better understand these gender differences, uh, sex disaggregated data is really uh, fundamental. Unfortunately, as you can see from this table uh, depicted here in this slide, uh, globally, while some 80% of countries are indeed regularly producing sex disaggregated statistics on topics like mortality, labor, forced participation, and education and training, only less than 33% do the same for informal employment, unpaid work, violence against women, entrepreneurship, and time use. And only 
7% regularly produce segregated data related to water. Um, this is very much in line with the presentation just delivered by uh, Guillaume. Um, overcoming this data gap in line with the call of the SDG 17 target 18 is really key to be able to monitor progress on gender equality and women empowerment in the water sector. Next, please. So taking into consideration this urgent need for universal methods and practical tools to collect such, such data, um, the UNESCO WAP has developed a toolkit on sex desegregated water data uh, designed to help close this gender data gap. Uh, the first edition was launched in 2015, and then in 2019, we published an update in alignment with the 2030 agenda and findings of field testing. And this toolkit consists of four tools. The first um, contains 105 gender responsive indicators that are grouped in 10 uh, priority topics. Um, then we have a methodological framework. We have the guidelines for the collection of data in the field and through desk research, and some 400 questions to um, collect data. Um, so in particular, uh, the topic number 10 is dedicated to water education and training, and it measures, for instance, the um, access of women to skill development, their access to gender sensitization training or water education training and employment. And actually, not only uh, the access of women, but of course, also uh, of men. Um, and what indeed organizes capacity development uh, workshops on the use of this toolkit and on other water related topics. Next, please. So another component that is essential for creating this enabling environment for gender equality in the water domain is, of course, funding. Um, data shows us that over 2017-2018 period, a yearly average of 48.7 billion of bilateral aid targeted gender equality and women empowerment, but most of it was actually spent in the areas of human rights, media, education, and only small shares went to uh, environment, poverty reduction, and economic development. And in addition to that, we also see that funding to women organization is decreasing steadily. Um, also, a public finance has been shown to fall short with a coverage ratio that falls between 31 and 50%, depending on the exact target, which is indeed a significant shortcoming. And water-related targets are even um, estimated to fall well below this range. So we see it. A similar picture uh, when we consider official development assistance um, in terms of its funding to the 2030 agenda, with the goals related to reducing inequality being among the ones least funded, um, with less than $1 billion uh, dedicated to them per year. Then what concerns funding um, by foundations, women funds, and other institutional donors to activities supporting women and environment. In 2014, a total of $110 million was allocated, but this represents less than 0.1% of all these foundation grants, and only 11% of this targeted water access and sanitation. Now, even though um, data specific to the water sector is very scarce, it can be inferred that gender strategies in the water sector and so also the associated capacity enhancement programs, they are seldomly funded adequately. Next, please. Um, directly aligned with, with uh, the topic of funding, of course, uh, let's take a quick look at women's access to financial services. And we see that globally about 1.1 billion women do not have access to financial services like bank accounts or insurances. And this of course has great impact um, as it reduces their opportunities um, to be entrepreneurs. And indeed over 70% of women owned businesses 
have inadequate or no access to financial services. And exactly these financial constraints, um, they of course extend into the water domain. And they may lead uh, to women being disadvantaged or even excluded in terms of water access that in turn, again, impacts their opportunities to be educated, training, or generate an income. And overall, this shows us that progress towards gender equality in the water sector will not accelerate until sufficient enabling resources are allocated. Next, please. So exactly to this behalf, UNESCO WAP has brought into life a call for action. Um, the initiative is called Accelerating Gender Equality in the Water Domain, uh, Bridging the Data Gap and Developing Concrete Action. And below there's the link displayed, but I will show it again in the next slide, please. Um, so in a nutshell, the objectives of this initiative are to Firstly, call upon all relevant actors to take a concrete and urgent action to break with this current status quo. Second, to inform the public and to break persistent stereotypes through awareness raising and capacity building. Thirdly, to encourage the development and maybe even more important, so the implementation of gender inclusive strategies in order to close this deep uh, policy practice gap. Um, we also aim to uh, ask to act upon the principles of gender equal funding, of course. And overall, uh, the main aim or the core aim is to accelerate action towards a gender transformative water domain based on concrete recommendations contained in a joint position paper that is currently also available online. Um, so this call for action, it is led by UNESCO WAP and it's supported by a large multi-stakeholder coalition. And since the aim is to continuously expand this coalition, uh, we would like to invite everyone um, to join the coalition on behalf of your government or any other relevant institutions that you may represent. Um, so please do visit the link displayed here, bit.ly slash accelerating gender equality, uh, so you can learn more about the initiative. And if you are interested to join us, you can contact us directly on this email address, water and gender call for action at unesco.org. So with this, I, I've come to the end of the presentation and uh, thank you so much for this invitation and your attention. Thank you very much for that, uh, Lorne. And I think it's really uh, it's significant that we see with each presentation we we, we sort of raise the stakes. I, I think the 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 conclusion that we are, we are facing not only a, a significant data gap but also a, a significant fin financing gap, and even seeing a financing for organisations that address gender issues and women's issues is is in decline. I think it really justifies very much the call for action and the fact that we, that WAP is now really raising this to, to, to the level of an urgent a global uh, emergency of sorts. I think it's a, it's a very important point uh, for us to, to make in this session. We have now our final uh, speaker to take, take us even, even higher, will be uh, Dr. Kwan Kao at uh, the Lao Country Director of the East and West. Uh, he is going to talk to us a bit about uh, increasing systemic participation of women as change agents uh, with a focus on the wash uh, sector in our PDR. I'm very happy to hand over the floor to, uh, to Kwan Kao for his presentation. Thank you very much. Okay. Hi, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Today I'm very excited because uh, we are in the different place, but we are talking about EDGC and we are talking about the water. Yeah, so <clears throat> it's exciting for me. Yeah. So my name is Kwan Kiao. I'm the country director of this uh, foundation, a tri network in Lao. Uh, today I am uh, going to present increased systemic participation of women as change agent in the water sector. 
Yes, uh, please go to another slide, please. <clears throat> Before I go to the detail of the presentation, I would like to provide some information about my organization. We empower the poorest, uh, most vulnerable power in Laos to improve the health of children and community to societies, inclusive and sustainable water and sanitation programs. Next slide, please. And this is the outline of my presentation. We have now context uh, our work and the project with South yeah, and uh, Women in War Challenge and Solution and uh, the next step plans. Yes. Next slide, please. So uh, the same with the other developing country in the world, uh, Lao is concerning with the uh, fund, with the technologies and human resource in developing the vast sectors. We have a natural resource, but we miss some uh, important part like a fun technology and human resource. Yeah. Uh, recently, uh, the pipe water system covered in Laos is just only 26%. Yeah. Just only 26%. Why is 80% of the population is living in the rural areas? And 20% of uh, water covers now just focus in the city only, not in the rural areas. And without access to, to the waters, he asked uh, in my countries, women and children, they are the main person who collect the water for their family dairies. And this is the workload for women and children. Yes. And the government just set up the strategy framework uh, to achieve 60% uh, coverage in safely managed water services and 40% of basic services by 2030. But government also have less capacity to support for financing. And without the capacity financing support for the governments, the public financing gap is around, uh, is around uh, 34 million US dollars a year. And government needs around 525 million US dollars to achieve the uh, strategic framework over 12 years. So how to support the government uh, and the strategy? So uh, this meeting, but after testing and we have experience and with support and includes uh, women in the water sectors, we can speed up double. We only two years we can build four water system. Like in 2018, 2019, we can build four water system. And the same in uh, 2020, 2021, we build under the four water system. So uh, currently it's, uh, more than uh, 4,500 households connect, connect to the pipe water system or support from, from East Midbeck a Tri Network and from uh, a private investor. And by the end of this year, of 2021, uh, more than 6,600 households will connect to the pipe water system. And next slide, please. So here, I would like to explain how we involve uh, women in the water sector. Long time ago, the government, uh, La Women Union is not involved in the water sector. I also discussed with uh, uh, women union at central level and provincial level. They said, oh, uh, uh, they focus on the uh, 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 genders uh, and women empowering something like that, but not in the West. But you see here, uh, La Women is a mass social organization. They go to the country at central levels, provincial level, district level, and also the village level. And they have member more than 1.1 million people in the country, while the total population of Lao is only 3.2 million. You see how many uh, women union members there. 
So when we include women uh, union in the WASC committee, so you will see the results of the of the uh, uh, when we include them. So the project information flow, the community participation, the gender empowering, something like this happened. Yes, when we include women in the WASC sector. Yeah. Next slide, please. And here I would like to show you some photo. Yes, on my my left hand side you will see uh, the the wife of a uh, 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 minister of public work and transport. She is uh, attending the opening ceremony of the pine water supply. And also we build the uh, primary school Latin for the children, and we also have a, a hand washing station for them. And at the, 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 the right hand side, you will see that uh, women in waste in the water sector, they, op they uh, own the water system and they signed a contract with the government to operate the water for 25 years. This is uh, by women. And at the center, the, the, the photo in the center, this is Mick Pix. She's now uh, 26 years old. When she was uh, six years or seven years old, she followed the mother to collect the, 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 the water in the river every day. And until now, she spent almost 70 years to collect the water in the life. This is, this is really a uh, workload for, for, for women and children. But today, no more uh, collect, collecting water from the river because her house already connect to the water system. Yeah. Okay, go to the next slide. Next slide, please. So I borrowed this presentation from my friends. So I just would like to show you how we uh, remove the, the barrier uh, for uh, access to the water of uh, water uh, access to the equality to the water. So yes, go, go to the next slide, please. Mr. Arfasuk, uh, we are almost at session time, so if you could wrap up. Okay, I will finish my presentation soon, yeah. Next, next slide, please. Yes, uh, uh, this is a work sustainable process. We will have uh, three uh, 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 members, three uh, like uh, uh, private investors, La Women Union and communities. So La Women Union's link between community and private investors together and make it for sustainable, yeah, for the uh, water system, yeah. Okay, yeah. Go, go, go to the next slide, please. And for the challenge and solution, this is for women unions uh, uh, because they have a limit opportunity uh, to work with the non governments uh, limit of staff, and lack of knowledge on was. So that's why we, the project, the uh, uh, policies include La Women Union there and co working with. I mean, the women union and they build the capacity to uh, ele electronic tool and uh, uh, yeah. So go to the next, next slide, please. And for the next step, we still uh, focus on uh, building the, 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 the pivotal system in Laos and we are focus on monitoring and evaluation. And of course, we are doing the sustainable process and I just explained that. Yes, next slide, please. And uh, we, we are established what the was team to cause the entrepreneurs and we we are target for 1 million users in the seventh year and we will do the fundraise for 10 million to do that. Yes. Next slide, please. Yes, so thank you very much for every dollar support from our donor. Yes, this is uh, my presentation. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for the uh, for the presentation and for all of these details. I am, we are really out of time. We are exceeding our time for the session. I want to thank all of the speakers and organizers for their contributions. Thank you all attendees for the questions and comments in the chat. It was a very lively chat. I was very happy to see the questions raised and the, and the positive comments given. Uh, I saw you were raising the questions about the gender panels on our panel. We would have loved to address that and to discuss that further. We won't have time. We will try to get back to you in writing on the questions and comments you have made. Uh, hopefully that will will help uh, uh, the, the the lack of discussion here today. It was a very intensive session. Thank you so much, everyone. With that, uh, back to Christine for any final words, and and we will close for today. Thank you. Um.
Okay, yes, actually, I, I, I don't have anything to add. Thank you again for the lively chat and for the speakers uh, and for our excellent moderator. And uh, like Hans said, we will try to address uh, the chat through writing. Thank you for joining us. Bye-bye.